cool. So we're going to do our little module five refresh now. Module five is equilibrium. Um, got a lot in there as well. It's quite jam packed. But as a little overview, we have first inquiry question on static and dynamic equilibrium. Second is on factors that affect equilibrium. That's when we talk about LCP, um, Le Chatelier's principle. Then we have inquiry question number three, calculating the equilibrium constant and solution equilibria. Those last two inquiry questions are quite calculation based, especially with the HSC. So um, yeah, be mindful of that. So in terms of like general things to remember with equilibrium, um, Reactions that have a forward and a reverse, those, those reversible reactions, they can exist at a state of dynamic equilibrium where the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Um, and that's what we talk about in the first inquiry question. Then we have LCP and then we have our calculations. So um, as a little refresh question, um, here it says equilibrium constant is 50 at 500 degrees Celsius. So remember with equilibrium constants, it is the equilibrium constant at a certain temperature because the only thing that can change the actual value of an equilibrium constant is temperature. No matter how much you add to the vessel, change the pressure, whatever, that doesn't change the equilibrium constant numerically. It will just shift and restate itself at that ratio. What changes the value of k numerically is temperature so that's why it's really specific that it's 50 at 500 degrees celsius then it asks how many moles are present at equilibrium so what you need to do is you need to write out the equilibrium constant expression for this system so it's products over reactants so you'd have um hydrogen iodide hi hi hydro iodic acid if you will, um, HI squared, because this is two in front, and then you have on the bottom, so like that's on the top, on the bottom you have the concentration of hydrogen gas multiplied by the concentration of iodine. Then you sub in, like, let's say, X, yeah, um, you sub in, what you call it? um x for like hi and then the um 0 0.1 and then you go for it you solve it mathematically and then you get an answer 0 0.7 moles um keep in mind that it you need to be aware of units when it comes to this stuff so you want to make sure that you're always working in moles um moles per liter like m big m you don't want to be working in just moles because if the vessel is like five liters um, in volume, then you'll have a very different concentration as um, the number of moles. But yeah, just a side note. So if we go on to some theory stuff as a refresh, um, also if you see me looking like, this is so not related to module five, but if you see me looking like upwards, it's because the monitor with all of the stuff is like bigger up there. Um, so like the camera's down here, but like the monitor's up there. Anyway, that's moving on. Um, so some definition stuff that you need to know. Static and dyna dynamic equilibrium. Static is when the rate of forward equals reverse and that rate is zero. So this is for irreversible reactions where it's gone to completion. That is static equilibrium. Dynamic is when the rate of forward equals the rate of reverse. So that's the equilibrium part. But this rate is greater than zero. So the reactions are still happening. They just don't look like anything's happening because it's happening only at a microscopic level with particles changing and that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah. Then you have open versus closed systems. It's a really common question to be asked about open and closed systems because it's so important to establishing dynamic equilibrium, having a closed system. Um, open system means that there's a transfer of matter and energy. So if you think of a beaker, just an open beaker, um, if you have water in there, um, the water can evaporate and escape as gas into the atmosphere. Um, same thing, like the atmosphere can come into the water and dissolve. Um, so that's a transfer of matter, and then it can also transfer energy. Closed system, if you think of 
something with a lid on it, um, like a test tube with a plug, um, that can't transfer matter. The water in the test tube can't be evaporated out. So it can only transfer energy, not matter. Isolated systems, nothing can transfer. It's just on its own. Kind of hard to get those, but um, they do exist because there's a definition for them. Something that usually gets overlooked when we talk about Module 5, mainly because you learn it in Module 4, so you don't go over it that much in Year 12, um, is entropy and enthalpy. So you need to know your exothermic and your endothermic reactions. Exothermic reaction, we have energy being released. Endothermic reaction, we have energy being absorbed. Um, so that's what those graphs show. You have the activation energy being smaller in exothermic reactions and larger in endothermic reactions. Um, you can just look at the graph and see how potential energy changes with the reaction progression. Um, so exothermic and endothermic, they relate to enthalpy. It relates to the heat content of the system. Entropy is something that relates to the chaos and disorder. So the more disorder there is, the higher the entropy. If you think about your states of matter, you have solids which live really close packed together. Um, very, yeah, very close. They can't move around much in a solid. That is a very ordered system. So that has low entropy. If you have gases, you have the particles buzzing around everywhere. They can move freely. They can do whatever they want. That is um, high entropy because there's lots of chaos and lots of disorder. So that's entropy and enthalpy. Um, the next kind of thing in module five before you go on to LCP, and sometimes you get questions that relate collision theory with LCP, but collision theory is um, about what is actually happening in reactions and what causes them to occur. And what causes them to, to occur are these collisions between particles. And in order to have a successful reaction, you need to have three different um, criteria met. So the first is having the particles actually hit each other. So you can't have hydrogen gas and iodine gas combining to make HI if those hydrogen and I, um, iodine aren't crossing over at all. If they're separate, there's no way that they can react. They have to actually hit each other for something to happen. So first thing they need, actual collisions. Next thing is activation energy. They need to reach a certain amount of energy. And once they reach that amount of energy, they can react. But if they don't reach it, they don't react successfully. Um, it must be enough to break bonds that are holding the original reactants together in the first place. So it needs to be enough energy to break those bonds um, to form the new bonds. Um, and then you have molecular orientation. This just means that they have to collide at the correct angle. You can't just have them collide anywhere. They have to collide at a specific angle for it to work. So um, if you think about it, that's a lot of things that need to go right for a reaction to occur. And in chemistry, you see a lot of reactions and apparently all of this is happening every single time you see one of those reactions. Um, it has to be very specific angle, um, very specific amount of energy, and then actual collisions. So when you talk about collision theory, most of the time you're using it to explain how could we increase rate of reaction or how could we decrease rate of reaction? So that's something to consider. Um, inquiry question two is about factors that affect equilibrium. And this is basically all LCP stuff, Le Chatelier's principle. Um, Le Chatelier, very famous. Um, you should know this definition like the back of your hand when it comes to the HSC. Because, um, yeah, LCP is everywhere and you need to be able to recite the definition of LCP on the spot if you need. So um, LCP is if you have a system at dynamic equilibrium and that system is disturbed, what would happen is the system will minimize that change. So it will minimize the disturbance, try to counteract it, and then establish a new equilibrium. So we need to think about that um, to figure out what happens when certain disturbances occur, um, which way it shifts, all that stuff. That's all LCP and that's all this second inquiry question. So with um, 
concentration. This is like the, I think this is the easiest one to wrap your head around. But if you have this reaction here, A plus B makes C plus C. Um, if you add B, you're increasing the concentration on the left-hand side, on the reactant side. So you have too many reactants and the system wants to counteract that change. So since you have too many reactants, what you want to do is use up those reactants so it goes back down to a normal amount. And by using up all those reactants, you end up making more products. You end up having a higher rate of reaction for the forward reaction compared to the reverse because you're using up more of the reactants. So that's why if you increase B or A, um, you'll increase the forward reaction rate, which is called a shift to the right. Um, if you increase C or D, you're increasing the amount of products. You have too many products, it increases, you want to get rid of it because LCP is all about minimizing change. You want to counteract the increase in C and D. So how do you do that? You use up C and D. So you've increased C and D, you use it up. How do you use it up? By the backward reaction. You do the reverse reaction and by doing the reverse reaction, you get rid of C and D and you increase A and B. So that's that. Same thing can be said about removing. So if you remove A or B, that's pretty much the exact same as increasing C or D. So if you remove A or B, um, you're decreasing that side. You're decreasing A and B. And to counteract that decrease in A and B, you want to increase it. So you want to do the opposite of removing. You want to add. So how you do that is you increase the rate of the backward reaction to fill it up again. Um, and same thing with the removal of C or D. So just got to think of like, what's the opposite of the disturbance? And then how can I make that opposite of the disturbance happen? So if we're remo removing something, the removal is the disturbance. We want to do the opposite of that disturbance. So we want to add. How do we add? By favoring that reaction. So hopefully that's all good. Um, okay, then pressure. So Pressure is something that applies to mostly gases. You'll get gas questions. Um, yeah, almost always gas. Never seen pressure with anything else because you can't really do pressure with anything else. But um, it's also related to volume. So Boyle's law is uh, a law that is in like, I guess, physics, Bio, it's just it's just a law of the world Boyle's law and it's that pressure and volume are inversely proportional so if you increase pressure you decrease volume um yeah if you decrease volume you increase pressure if you increase volume so if you make something bigger um you decrease the pressure so I like to think of all changes in pressure in terms of volume just because it's easier for me to wrap my head around but everyone thinks of things differently so for me we have this reaction um we have the harbor process being shown so nitrogen and hydrogen being turned into ammonia and what's happening is let's say we have an increase in the volume if we have an increase in the volume if it's in an inverse propor proportional relationship between volume and pressure increase in volume means a decrease in pressure a decrease in pressure um, is what's occurring here. Um, so first step in figuring out what the shift is, is looking at the molar ratio. So you compare the left with the right. On the left, we have four moles, so three plus one. And then on the right, we have two moles, which is from the two ammonia. Then I like to think of it in terms of the volume, as I said. So if I'm increasing the volume, I have lots more space to work with and I want to fill up that space. So I go to the side that produces more moles because I want to fill up the space. It's quicker than going to the side with less moles because it won't fill up the space as much as the more moles side. So I'd go in favor whichever reaction produces the most amount of moles. In this case, it's the side with four. I want to make four moles of gas. So I'd be favoring the reverse reaction. It would shift left. This will mean that there will be an increase in concentration of nitrogen and hydrogen by decreasing concentration of ammonia. So if it was the opposite way around, oh, sorry, skipped too quickly. If it was the opposite way around, if we 
decreased the volume, I'd want to go to the side with the least amount of moles because I have a smaller space. I don't want to be occupying all that space. It would be too cramped. So I want to favor the side that is less cramped, which is the two mole side. So I would favor the forward reaction then. Um, or you can just like, I like to think of it in terms of how much space they take up. But you can also just think of it as if you increase pressure, you want to go to the least amount of side, um, least moles, decrease pressure, more moles side. Um, yeah, but I just like to think of it in terms of volume. Then finally, another thing that can influence um, LCP is temperature. So we have to consider whether something is endothermic or exothermic before we figure out which way it shifts. So if we have a forward reaction that's endothermic, what would happen is if we increase temperature, the temperature of like the temperature increase has an increase in the rate of reaction for both forward and reverse. That's the first thing that would happen because just if you increase temperature, more particles have enough activation energy to collide, more collisions happen, greater rate of reaction. So that's the first thing that happens. But then there's a shift in equilibrium. And what happens is the endothermic reaction, um, let's say the endothermic reaction is the forward one. We know that endothermic reactions absorb heat. So if we heat it up, um, we have all this excess heat. What are we going to do with all this energy, all this excess heat? It wants to be absorbed by the endothermic reaction. So when it temperature increases, the endothermic reaction is favored. So in if it's an endothermic forward reaction, it'll shift right. If it's an exothermic forward reaction, um, so let's say, yeah, let's it's an exothermic forward reaction. Um, what would happen is if you increase the temperature, you increase the temperature, you have all this excess heat, what are you going to do with it? You want to absorb it. You want to get rid of that excess heat because that's the opposite of adding heat. You remember LCP is about counteracting all that stuff. So if I have too much heat, I counteract it by adding like, Oh, sorry. if you have too much heat, um, you counteract it by absorbing um, and you absorb heat through endothermic reactions. Since a forward reaction would be exothermic, you would favor the reverse, which would be endothermic. And then that would shift left. So you need to figure out which whether the forward reaction is endothermic or exothermic before you can make a decision about which shift it is. But um, Overall rule is if there's an increase in temperature, it will favor the endothermic. A decrease in temperature will favor the exothermic. Um, another thing is catalysts. So um, adding a catalyst decreases the activation energy. Um, and this is just something that increases the rate of reaction. doesn't really cause a shift in equilibrium. Um, but activation energy can be used to help explain why endothermic reactions are favored when temperature is increased. Um, just because endothermic reactions, they have a higher activation energy. Um, the higher activation energy with heat, more particles are reaching that activation energy. So they cross. It makes it easier for the reaction. Anyway. Um, okay, the last bits of our module 5 refresh are this. Um, so calculating equilibrium constant, just remember to have the coefficients as the powers, like the squares. And um, yeah, so you want to make sure that you have products on the top, reactants on the bottom, and um, put the coefficients up into the corners. You want to make sure that in the square brackets, when you are calculating equilibrium constant, that it's in moles per liter. Um, doesn't work out if it's not in moles per liter, so make sure you're taking into account the volume. Um, and also just know what K means. So if you have a really high K EQ, um, if you think about it, that high K EQ is meaning there's a high amount of products in relation to reactants. So we're laying really far on the product side. If it's a low, it'll be greater on the reactant side. So we'd be further on the left. Um, if there are some questions where you haven't really reached 
equilibrium yet. Um, and it's a question asking whether or not you've reached equilibrium. And this is when you use Q. Q's got the exact same formula as K, but you just sub in the concentrations that you're given. You don't really sub in um, the equilibrium concentrations because then it would be at equilibrium. Um, if Q is less than K, then you favor the forward reaction to reach equilibrium because we're too small. We have too many reactants. We want to go a little bit more to the right to um, reach K. If Q is greater than K, we're too far to the right. We want to move a little bit back to get to K. So we need to um, shift left, favor reverse reaction. Temperature is the only factor that can change K like numerically. Um, I said that earlier, but yeah. Last inquiry question for module five is solution equilibria. Um, this is all about solutions. It's KSV. First thing in solution equilibria is the dissolution of ionic compounds and what that looks like on a molecular level with bonds. So ionic compounds, they have ionic bonds. Um, they live in that little lattice structure where the anion and cation alternate because positive and negatives repel each other. I mean, positives and positives repel each other and negatives and negatives repel each other. So they have to alternate positive, negative, positive, negative to held together, to be held to, to, to be held together. Um, anyway, yeah. Then you have water, which is what it's dissolving in. These have a bunch of intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding, diaper diaper forces, and dispersion forces. What happens when you dissolve it is they form ion dipole forces. So the positive hydrogen from the um yeah, the positive hydrogens from water, because water is H2O, the H is a positive, the O is negative. The positive hydrogens are attracted to the anion and the negative oxygen is attracted to the cation. And those are your ion dipole forces. Um, and the formation of those ion dipole forces, um, they release enough energy to break the bonds of the ionic lattice, which causes it to dissolve. The other kind of um, theory thing that you have to be familiar with for um, so solution equilibria is the removal of toxins in cycad fruits. Um, this is through a process called leaching. Leaching just means you have boiling water, you run it through the crushed cycad fruit, and this causes it to go from a solid state inside the little kernels to an aqueous state. If it's running water or like you put it in a bowl and you constantly change the water, it means it can never reach equilibrium. So you're constantly drawing out the toxins into the aqueous form never reaches equilibrium it just keeps on going until all the toxin is dissolved and then you can get rid of it um, and that's how you remove the toxins solubility rules are the other thing that you have to memorize for the hsc you might not need to memorize it now but it's a good idea to get used to them um, a good way that i remember it uh, nag sag is nag sag um, nag sag is a little thing that I remember to remember what is soluble. So N stands for nitrates, A is for ammonias, G is for group 1, S is for sulfates, A is for acetates, and G is for group 7. For group 7 you have a couple of exceptions. Um, I remember those exceptions as PMS. P is for lead because lead is PB. M is for mercury and S is for silver. And then for sulfate, you also have a few exceptions. I remember it as castro bear, um, castro bear being calcium, strontium, barium. Those are the main ones that I remember. Um, Nagsag is just a really easy way to remember the main types of um, like solids that you'll find or solutions that you'll find. So that's a good thing. Um, and then to the um, calculation bit. Um, KSP is basically KEQ, but for a uh, dissociation equation, and it's just, it's called a solubility product, that's what SP is for, um, and for solubility product, you are just multiplying the concentration of the two different ions once a salt has dissolved, um, and then you, like, account, like, you put a square if there's two of them, 
um, you just account for the balancing as well, just like you would for equilibrium. And you make sure you put um, the moles per litre in those square brackets. Molar solubility is another thing that comes up a lot in KSB questions, and this just means the moles per litre of um, a salt that can be dissolved into water. Sometimes you get solubility given in grams per litre or grams per 100 grams or really anything. Um, I've seen kilograms per litre. So you just need to convert it to moles per litre if you want to use it with KSP in any form. Um, to find if a precipitate will form, what you need to do is you need to calculate the solubility um, and, well, don't calculate the solubility, sorry. You're almost always given, like, stuff. Then you use the solubility and you use the KSP um, and you see if Q, which, again, has the same um, formula as K, you just see if Q is greater or less than K. If Q is greater than K, Q is greater than K, um, that means that a precip precipitate will form. If Q is less than K, then a precipitate won't form. Um, cool. So here are a few practice questions. Um, this is just saying which set of conditions would produce the highest yield. Um, we can see there are two moles of gas on the left, one mole of gas on the right. So um, to produce the highest yield of phosphogene, which is on the right, we would want a high pressure. And then it is a negative enthalpy change. So negative enthalpy change means the forward reaction is exothermic. Exothermic forward reaction means that we want low temperatures. F4C. Um, this is just another question. I won't really go through it because I kind of don't have time to, but if I do have time at the end, I'll come back to it. Um, this is what I was talking about with predicting the formation of a precipitate. So we're given concentrations um, of the ions, so Pb and Cl. So we know that the salt that's dissolving is PbCl2, lead chloride. Um, which means that our KSP would be the concentration of PB multiplied by the concentration of Cl squared because there will be two Cls. Um, and then you just sub in. So it would be 0 0.1 times 0 0.02 squared. And you get a QSP that is greater than KSP, which means that a precipitate will form. Um, so where did I get the KSP from, you might be thinking, to compare with the QSP? That's what your data sheet is for. So your data sheet is like one of your best friends in your exam because it has the periodic table on it. Um, but it also has a list of KSPs. And if the question doesn't say a specific KSP, that means that you're expected to get the KSP from the data sheet. Um, so it's on the very first page, really easy to see, very well labeled. It's got everything you need on there. You just use that. Um, another good thing about having the KSP on the data sheet is that it kind of gives you a hint as to what is soluble and what is insoluble, because if it's got a KSP, that usually means it's insoluble, um, it'll form a precipitate. So if you're ever confused if something can form a precipitate or not, um, look at your KSP on your data sheet, and if it's there, that means it probably will form a precipitate, it probably is insoluble. Um, cool. And this is uh, calculating the equilibrium concentration. This comes down to algebra. Um, this type of question, you're given the KSP and you need to find the um, equilibrium concentration. You approach it like an ice table. Um, approaching it like an ice table, you write ice your ice table and then you just fill it in. So it told us that um, we started off with sodium chloride at this concentration. So the chloride is the common ion, because this is a common ion effect question. Um, since chloride is your common ion, you put that concentration there. Fill out your ice table, and then you sub stuff in. For common ion effect questions, there's a little extra step that you have to make to make sure that you're not doing quadratic formula. 
And that's just having a little statement saying that you assume that X is negligible in comparison to the initial concentration of chloride. So then you can cut down that plus X to just being 1 times 10 to the negative 2 instead of 1 times 10 to the negative 2 plus X. Um, and that just makes the calculations easier. And then you just follow...